behavior in non-hyperbolic spaces or non-hyperbolic groups. And so what I want to talk about today is how one can use boundaries to do exactly that, to identify hyperbolic-like behavior in things that are not necessarily hyperbolic. So let's um, start by reviewing just the basics of hyperbolic boundaries, and then we'll start playing with them. So, um, so let's take um, the boundary I want to talk about. I want to talk about it as a topological space, and what I'm talking about, so, so x is, is a um, hyperbolic space now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to review or uh, um, talk about the boundary of X, by which I mean the Gromov boundary, the visual boundary, and sometimes so. Okay, so let's recall what that is. So first of all, um, uh, um, as points, it just consists of uh, G that's a raise. relation on them, namely um, alpha is equivalent to beta if they're bound with Hausdorff distance. That is to say that alpha lives in a bounded neighborhood of beta, beta lives in a bounded neighborhood of, of alpha. So there's a uniform bound on how far apart they get. Okay. Um, okay, so that's what it is. As a set, uh, we're also going to be talking a little about the topology. There are several ways to define the topology. I'd like to define it in terms of a neighborhood basis. So there's one way to define the topology is as follows. So I'm going to tell you a neighborhood basis. Um, say a basis for um, a, a neighborhoods around some, some element alpha or equivalent to class of alpha. So um, this is uh, sets of the form um, U alpha R, which are um, uh, equivalence classes of rays beta, such that um, um, the distance from alpha t to beta t uh, is less than 2 delta, delta being, sorry, this is the, the delta of the hyperbolic, of course, um, 2 delta um, for all t less than, less than alpha. In other words, just so here we have um, alpha, and we want beta to stay close to alpha for, um, for the first R for, for a while, and then it can go off and do whatever it wants after that, okay? And then by taking smaller and smaller, uh, larger and larger R's, excuse me, they stay close longer and longer, and um, um, that's, that get, turns out to give a neighborhood basis for the topology. All right. Okay, so um, what are some of the properties? It's a uh, boundaries of, of um, uh, hyperbolic spaces have played a big role in the, in, in, in the whole theory of hyperbolic spaces. So let's list a few properties. Um, so uh, let's see. The first one, which is perhaps the most important from the point of view of geometric group theory, is um, if f mapping x into y is a quasi isometry. Um, then if the induced map and down against the boundary y, which is the obvious induced map, is a homeomorphism. Okay, so up to homeomorphism, the boundary is 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 um is independent, is well defined on quasi isometry classes. In particular, we can talk about the boundary by the hyperbolic group. So this allows us to make sense, you know, it's a well-defined notion of the boundary of a hyperbolic group. Okay, so this is a this is a um, key property. Um, there are um, all kinds of other properties. I'm going to just fill a list of few that are going to come up in this talk. Um, the second one is the property I call visibility. Okay, so supposing I'm on the boundary, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got two points, alpha and beta, on the boundary. I want to know if I'm standing at one of them, can I see the other one? Okay, seeing is means your, your eyesight is along geodesics. So we're asking, so a priori, this is some way to here, and this is some way to here, right? And I'm asking, is there a bi-infinite geodesic that goes from here to here? Can I see one from the other, okay? So the visibility says that's always possible. So given alpha, theta, and the boundary, there exists a bi-infinite geodesic gamma, such that in one direction um, it's equivalent to alpha, and in the other direction um, it's equivalent to beta. So 
right? So we can see alpha from there. Um, okay, the third property, which won't be quite there on that. Um, um, well, it's really just a, a, a whole collection of, prop, of, of properties, namely um, if uh, we have um, a group action. Well, actually, uh, let, let me not say a whole group action. Let's just take a single isometry. It's the kind of dynamics that we heard about a lot in the, in the last section. We can identify the nature of an isometry, uh, if we have an action G of isometry, and we look at what happens when we apply it over and over again, we can identify the nature of that isometry by, it, by what it does to the boundary. Does it fix one point, you know, does it fix a single point, does it fix many points? Um, so uh, let me just say um, dynamics, I'm not going to write it out, dynamics of um, action. Only other point you can see, right? So 
no way to get wider than the JVS between any other two points. So visibility fails horribly. Um, and finally, the dynamics, well, dynamics, um, there is some dynamical information, but there's also a lot of um, stuff you lose. So for example, Z2 acting on the plane acts trivially on the boundary. So, you know, you've got, you have, there are, there is stuff, still some good dynamical stuff, but you don't have more south dynamics in general, you don't have, you can have, you, you have, um, I'll just say, I don't want to go into detail, lose much uh, dynamic. It's not nearly as strong and as nice as it is in the, in the hyperbolic case. Of five. Okay, so, um, so, what, so, uh, our first, oh, I forgot to say, Joint. We're supposed to say this. Okay, joint work with. Because um, I'm going to start talking about what I've done now. So, um, um, so this is going to be what I'm talking about is joint. Orig the original paper um, was joint um, with um, Harold Sultan. I'm also going to be mentioning um, some work. I'll, I'll say as I get to it, but some work of um, Matt Cordes, who's here. And um, Matt will be uh, talking tomorrow afternoon about his stuff, so I will just mention it briefly and then we'll talk about it tomorrow afternoon. And finally, <laughs> some work I've been doing with um, another student, um, Devin. So, um, I will mention your names as I go along as well. I just want to make sure I get them all there. Okay, so, um, um, so yeah, so, so our, our uh, initial goal was to. Um, 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 oh, uh, yeah, was to, oh, two things. Oh, let me say one more word here. So, so this is the cat zero case. We could try and push it even farther to things that are just ge some more general geodesic metric spaces that aren't necessarily in cat zero. And when we try to do that, even the definition starts to fail. And the reason is this is no longer a neighborhood basis. It doesn't satisfy this. So you don't even get a good definition of a boundary in general for an arbitrary um, geodesic metric. Okay, so so um, so things fall apart as you move you move down the you know after you become more general things start to fall apart you you, you lose the concept of the boundary and something. Okay, so um, so the original work with um, with uh, that I did with um, Harold Sultan was the cat zero case. We were trying to figure out if there was a way to get a boundary that was better behaved, in particular to have some notion of a boundary for a cat zero group. Okay, so. Um, so, uh, so, so the question is: so, if, to ask this question, you you um, can look at the list of properties for uh, hyperbolic and for cat and for and that fail for cat zero, and you say, why did they work here, and why don't they work here? And the and the short answer is the Morse law, the Morse property. All right. So, um, so um, question: what makes um, hyperbolic boundaries? Uh, why, why are all these properties so nice? And the answer, in some sense, the simple answer is the most problem. So let's review what that is. We've seen it. But let me, um, for, for completeness, let's um, write down what the Morse property is. So this is a property that every uh, geodesic ray or by infinite geodesic in hyperbolic space satisfies. So, um, so, um, um, we can make it the um, definition in general. So a um, a geodesic, a or or biogenic, whatever you want, geodesic alpha um, is Morse. If there exists um, um, constants, it's actually a function because m is going to depend on um, the uh, quasi-isometric constants, lambda and epsilon. So it's actually a function. Um, um, such that um, for all, such that if um, data is a lambda epsilon plus a g vector with n points alpha, then data Bounded, but the bound depends on how quasi this is. 
down which depends on the Boston constants. Um, uh, okay, so that's uh, what Morse means, and also I'd like to get, um, at this point um, throw in another definition, which was uh, a condition we um, used in the original paper, which is the notion of contracting. So let's also define that. So a G as a Finally, x um, uh, an arbitrary G of S in space. 
well, maybe, I, I don't know if this can be proper or whatever, but anyway, in general, we get um, alpha morphs implies contracting the homogular ratio. We lose the numbers. Okay, so, um, Other way around. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I got that. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. Later, but just so you have a, um, a picture in your head. Um, um, of, of, and as I said, this is the case we're mostly going to be focused, primarily going to be focusing on. So let's take an example of a, of a cat zero space and see what's worse and what's not worse. Okay? So here's, a, here's um, um, the easiest, uh, my favorite easy example to show people is we're going to take x to be the universal cover of, um, of, of a torus. Wedge a circle. So this is on T2 wedge S1. Okay? And for us, wedge on a circle, and you take its universal cover. So what do you see? Well, you see lots and lots of planes, which I'll think of as being horizontal, and then you see uh, vertical lines corresponding to, to this. Okay? So I've got a plane, and a vertical line, and another plane. And I, and I call it, I sometimes refer to this thing as a tree of flats. It's kind of tree like, but it has a, you know, you should stand out your vertex when you go up here, you have a whole flat and then a whole lot of ways to go up again. So I sometimes refer to this, it's not quite right, it just is a quick way of saying what I'm referring to. This space is the tree of flats. All right. Okay, what's more simple? What's the geodesic? Well, a geodesic, it travels along maybe in a flat for a little while, and then it goes up and down, and then it travels along another flat, and then it goes up and down, and then it keeps going. Okay, well, anytime you're in a flat, your, your, your projection, your, your um, um, contracting gets bad. I mean, you can, you can project it into something the entire width of that thing in, in the flat, right? And it turns out that's basically it. That's the problem, that's it. Namely, it's more, or it's contracting, either one, I mean, it's cat zero, so the equivalent. It's contracting if and only if the amount of time it spends in any flat is uniformly bounded. If and only if there's a uniform bound on how long it spends in flats. So um, alpha uh, um, ray and x is contracting. Um, if and only if there's uniform uniform down on time spent in each flat. It can do that as many times as it wants. It can spend, you know, 100 hours and every flat it comes to, but then it's got to leave. It's, the, it's just a uniform now, okay? And it's pretty clear that the traffic constant can be basically read off those lines. And you can see the longer we allow it to spend, the worse the traffic constant. So this is what I was saying. That that's, the, that's the sort of thing that you're going to get. Okay? All right. So, um, um, okay. So let's define um, uh, uh, yeah, so we're ready to define the Morse boundary or the contracting boundary. So uh, we originally called this, um, we originally called this, I think I would have defined in general. Um, no, I wasn't called this, I was going to define it for cat zero. Let's define it for cat zero, and then I'll wave my hands about what happens more gently. So, because um, it's a little easier to get your mind around with cat zero. Is. So uh, let's, let's say um, x to be a proper cat zero. why I'm more still contracting. In our first paper, we call it the contracting boundary. More still contracting boundary. As follows. So uh, I'm just going to call it boundary square x. Um, sometimes we put an M and sometimes a C. Let's just call it boundary square x. So it's going to be um, a guarantee that's raised, but we're only going to allow um, 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 x um, ones which are more sore contracting. Take your pick. Um, let's say, uh, let me say contracting. 
I'll explain why I prefer to use contracted here. But Morse would have worked just as well as they're perfect, right? Okay, so, um, uh, and with the same, with the same equivalence relation, and by the way, it's not a difficult lemma to show that if two are equivalent houses are distance from each other, and one of them is contracting the other. There's no problem with the, with the equivalence relation, okay? So, um, okay, so that's what it is as a set, but we're going to put maybe not the topology one might expect. So one topology, after all, as a set, this is contained in the visual bound. Right? It's just a subset of the visual bound. And we could, of course, put the, the, the subspace topology on. Right? I'm not going to, and I will explain later why I'm not going to. So let me tell you what topology I am going to put on it. So first of all, I'm going to look at certain subsets of this. Namely, I'm going to look at this to be the ones where I limit to D mapping. Or here, you have to be a little careful, a representative which is, has a representative which is D contracting. Or you can fix a base point. There's various ways you can do this. Fix a base point and look at D contracting. So I'm maybe I'm, I'm a little hand here. But anyway, we're going to limit the contracting constant and look at those. Okay, and that, I am going to take the subspace topology on this. All right, so the topology is going to play a big role in what I'm talking about.